There could be nothing more brutal than that defeat in the swamps and the forests. That was the account in the Chronicles of Rome. Three imperial legions annihilated in the swamps of Germania in the autumn of the year 9 AD. The battle was a turning point in European history. Because Rome failed to conquer the lands up to the river Elbe, let alone the lands further east. The Romans would withdraw to their defenses along the Rhine and the Danube. Europe was split in two, down the ages to come. It was the beginning of a German legend, the greatest military power of the ancient world brought to its knees by an iron alliance of freedom-loving tribes. 19th century German nationalists made this battle in the swamps, the founding act of the modern nation. Since 1875, a monument to the victor dominates the landscape. Arminius to the Romans, or Hermann, the first hero of German liberation. Since then, Arminius is all but forgotten in this country. This is his story. Julius Caesar gave the same name to all the tribes in the inaccessible regions east of the Rhine, Germani. They were forever making incursions into Roman territory. Even before the birth of Christ, Augustus Caesar decided to protect the exposed eastern flank of the empire in Gaul. In a series of campaigns, the Germanic tribes were to be subdued. Some put up a struggle. Others, like the Cherusci, allied themselves with Rome. This tribe now live under the iron fist of the Pax Romana. A young boy lives here. Later, he will be called Arminius. When he's about 10 years old, his life is changed forever. Arminius is of noble blood. His father, Segemerus, belongs to Cheruscan aristocracy. But Segemerus is firmly opposed to the alliance with Rome. The nobles have chosen Segestes as the leader of their clan. Segemerus must accept his leadership and his decisions. But Segestes is not welcome in this company. Segestes has chosen the alliance with Rome, and now he has come to fulfill the conditions of the alliance. He has come for Segemerus's sons. They must be handed over to the occupiers at once. It is, he says, a necessary sacrifice that must be made for the good of the whole tribe. It means that Segimerus may never see the boys again. They will become Romans. Taking hostages was a favorite Roman ploy. Chiefs like Segestes were their agents, with everything to gain from cooperating. We know relatively little about the early history of the Cherusci. 
They suddenly turn up in the time of Augustus. For a while they were Rome's enemies, but then they formed an alliance with Rome. Segestes was the leading figure among the Cherusci at the time of the Roman conquest. When a colossal superpower like Rome collides with a relatively small tribe, it's not really surprising if part of the clan, or the whole tribe, decide to form an alliance with the enemy. Everything we know about the Germans comes from ancient Roman texts. Writers like Paterculus, Tacitus or Cassius Dio used accounts by Roman soldiers returning from Germania. The Germanic tribes had no writing, so they have left no version of the story of Arminius. Arminius and his brother Flavius, the fair one, will be brought up as Romans, so they can return to their homeland one day as representatives of Roman power. To the Romans, this seems a sure way to consolidate their control. Who else can they trust when families and clans among their Cheruscan allies are split between the enemies and friends of Rome? But it's misleading even to speak of a unified people and call them Germans. There are dozens of tribes constantly fighting each other. For the Romans, this really is a terra incognita, an unknown world. From the Roman point of view, they were entering a territory of a sort they had never conquered before. Gaul had a quite different structure. It was Celtic, it already had permanent towns, and its tribes were much more hierarchically stable than tribes in Germania. The Germanic people live for themselves, separated from each other, said the Roman historian Tacitus. The bigger settlements numbered up to 25 houses with humans and animals living under the same roof. Towns and cities like those in the rest of the empire are unknown here. And for the Romans, the people are uncivilized savages living more like animals than humans. Tacitus tells us they live in a wild landscape between the rivers Rhine and Elbe, a landscape covered with vast, dense forests of oak and birch. The place Tacitus describes is deeply foreign. The marshes that cover this territory are repulsive. The forests make one shiver with fear. What disturbed the Romans most was that there were no roads, no trade routes, and there were no fixed points to aim for, no castles or strongholds to take, just this dreadful forest that took nine days to cross without encountering a single human being. It was a nightmare for the Romans. The impenetrable forests were totally unsuited to Roman military tactics and logistics. Being sent to Germania in the freezing north was seen by most Roman soldiers as a punishment. And they were scared because they had never seen forests. After centuries of building Roman cities and naval fleets, there were scarcely any forests left in Italy. They were stationed in Northern Europe. They knew they didn't belong here. Julius Caesar wrote, even if they walk for 60 days, no one can say they have come to the end of this forest and no one can even know where it ends. Rome 
Throughout the Mediterranean region, Rome had an urban culture. They lived in towns, and compared to that, what they found in Germania was very primitive. It was simple. The basic elements of Roman civilization and achievements were missing. It was a real collision of two cultures. For Arminius and Flavius, their route towards the Roman world would have taken them first through the forests to the River Rhine. This is where the Roman world began. where the first solid evidence of Rome's engineering mastery was a great fortress and a bridge spanning the river. From this army camp at Vetera, many thousands of legionaries protect Rome's frontier along the river. It's only one of many camps along the Rhine. The Romans founded cities like Cologne, Koblenz and Mainz shop windows for Roman civilization. But the message they give is not keep away. They're a magnet for the barbarians who engage in flourishing trade with the Romans. Long blonde hair is especially valuable. The Germans accept coins they've never seen before for their hides and furs. My name is Gal Tribesmen with nothing to sell work as laborers for the Romans. It's a tempting new world. It must have made an incredibly powerful impression on the Germanic tribesmen. The way the Romans built their towns, the complicated organization behind it, their skill at calculation and measurement, their skill at providing a supply of running water, all that would have made an enormous impression. You can imagine the tribesmen standing there open-mouthed. They must have been absolutely astounded. The separation from his family must have been painful for Arminius. But there were plenty of new impressions to distract him. And the barbarian brothers will have been an attraction in their own right. The sons of nobles get privileged treatment. including their first miraculous experience of heated floors. This is the journey of a lifetime, up the river Moselle, through the cities of the Roman province of Gaul, then across the Mediterranean to the capital city of the ancient world. It was a popular tactic for the Romans. They brought nobles' sons to Rome and educated them at the prince's school on the Palatine Hill. They served two purposes. On the one hand, they were hostages, guaranteeing the good behavior of their fathers. But on the other hand, they were brought up as Romans. And when they went back to their own people, they were expected to behave as Romans. It would have been like that with Arminius, because when he was a boy, the Romans were certainly taking noble hostages in Germania. Arminius and Flavius may have reached Rome about 9 BC. First they passed the workers' stone tenements in the teeming suburbs. Then they neared the center of the biggest city in the world with its million inhabitants. Arminius arrives in a city that is flourishing as never before, 
Great parade routes crisscross the city. Marble glistens in the Mediterranean sun. There had never been a longer period of peace, and never had the Roman Empire been as big as it was under the Emperor Augustus. Under Augustus, the Roman Empire had expanded to a size it had never known before. And Augustus extended the Roman Empire far further than any single Roman had done before him. Just think about it, northern Spain, the Alps, great swathes of territory as far as the Danube, inner Anatolia, Judea, Egypt, Africa. He added all this to the Roman Empire. It reached an enormous geographical span. And yet later, the time of Augustus would be associated with peace. And that's because he made peace in Rome after decades of civil war. Roman against Roman. But in his foreign policy, Augustus was anything but an emperor of peace. He waged war non-stop throughout his reign. As a young man, Arminius becomes part of Rome's gigantic war machine. He soon grasps the key to Rome's military success, discipline. It can't have been easy for a Cheruscan to submit to strict drill and unquestioning obedience. Germanic warriors reject firm leadership. But Arminius proves an excellent pupil. A young man, quick to pick things up and unusually talented for a German, is a contemporary verdict. This Cheruscan is turning into the perfect Roman soldier. This education of a Germanic tribesman in the Roman Empire always had two sides. A technical side, how do I lead an army, what weapons do I carry, and an ideological side. Politics and Rome as one and the same thing. Rome as the ideal we should worship. And the Romans combined them. Around 1 BC, Arminius receives his first posting to Pannonia in the Balkans. He's a captain of the Auxilia, a mounted force of Germanic mercenaries. Tribes in this Balkan province have risen against Rome. Rome hits back hard, sending 15 legions, more than 100,000 men, half the entire army, to crush the rebels. It's a show of the absolute superiority of Roman military tactics. Fire! 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 Roman power lies not in the courage of individual soldiers, but in the strategic cooperation of military units. Arminius will never forget this lesson. In open warfare, Rome is invincible. Two different ways of waging war meet head-on here. The Roman army is professional and disciplined. Different ranks have precisely defined skills and roles. Each man knows he can do this or that. He commands so many men and he has the means and equipment to do this or that. For the Germans, however, this was a relationship that had grown together between chiefs and nobles and selected warriors who would cross from tribe to tribe, who had sworn allegiance to those chiefs. In their own way, the warriors were professionals too. It was a personal relationship. And in some ways, of course, it also instilled discipline. That is, it was a question of honor. And it was a situation in which they were attached to this one man and they owed him allegiance. 
the Romans advanced in a closed formation called the tortoise. The barbarians attacked in a wedge-shaped formation called the boar's head. The force of the impact is only momentarily effective. The armored legions can mow down their attackers. Ranks so tightly closed, they function like a single body. We don't know exactly what Arminius did in the Pannonian War, but he must have fought with distinction. Back in Rome, the Emperor Augustus makes him a knight, the highest honor open to a member of a Germanic tribe. A noble son from the forests of Germania has become a respected citizen of Rome. Fifteen years since he left home. Impossible to say whether he misses his family, the freedom, the endless forests. Impossible to say what ambitions he holds today. We know of many cases where Germanic tribesmen in the service of Rome learned how to behave in the Roman way without feeling Roman or becoming loyal to Rome. It's not easy to make people genuinely committed to a system that may bring them great privileges, but also requires a change of identity. Not everyone can do that. In the year 7 AD, Augustus appoints a new governor for Germania. He's a relative called Publius Quinctilius Varus. He's described as physically corpulent and spiritually complacent. And yet, Varus has proved himself in a crisis. He crushed a Jewish revolt as governor in Syria, crucifying 2,000 rebels. He came into this rich province a poor man, and he left this poor province a rich man, they said later. In his glory days, coins were minted with his likeness, a rare privilege. Varus had the skills and experience a Roman senator selected for that job in Germania would need. And Augustus would certainly not have sent someone there just because he was a relative, unless he was also convinced that he had the experience to carry out what was expected of him. But then, Augustus makes a decision with unforeseen consequences. He sends Arminius to Germania at Varus's side. It's a decision that will have pleased Varus. Arminius has the reputation of being brave, disciplined and loyal. And he knows the Cheruski and their fighting style. He speaks their language. In 7 AD, Arminius comes back to his homeland. Over the past 15 years, the Romans have surged on, building up their new province, constructing camps along the rivers Rhine, Main and Lippe to consolidate their control in Germania Magna. Haltern on the Lippe is their administrative center, the capital of the new province. Close to today's Roman museum at Haltern, they create a base for three legions, a total of 20,000 men. Barracks, 
smithies for making weapons, kilns for pottery, and villas for the high officials. And on the Lippa is a harbour for the supply of Roman goods and luxuries that make life bearable in these barbarian lands. Right from the beginning, the Romans tried to give the impression that they had subdued Germania. In his last will and testament, Augustus wrote, I have conquered Germania as far as the mouth of the Elbe. Whenever a general won a little victory in Germania, he would call himself Germanicus, as if to say he had the Germanic tribes under control. The Romans minted coins showing Germania as a woman sitting on the ground in mourning with a broken spear. So ordinary Romans really would have got that impression. But Tacitus contradicted that. He said, that's nonsense. Germania has not been defeated. The Germanic tribes are living just as they did 200 years ago, completely free. On his return, Arminius may have looked in vain for the signs of Roman domination. Some distance from the Roman forts, the advanced Roman way of life is nowhere to be seen. Arminius will have taken the opportunity to be reunited with his father, Segimerus. The time to speak of the greatness of Rome or of his homeland. However warm the greeting, his father must have had mixed feelings at seeing his son enter the family house in the uniform of a Roman soldier. Arminius must have paid lip service to the advantages brought by Rome by being part of the empire, the wealth, skills and justice and an end to the endless civil wars between the Germanic tribes. There will soon be roads, cities, even heated stone floors instead of beaten clay. But these are two men talking past each other. For Segimerus, his son is denying the land of his birth. The Romans are squeezing the tribes for tributes like the grapes for their sour wine counting them like cattle to levy taxes and forbidding free men to bear weapons. Without a sword, a Cheruscan cannot be free. But his people are powerless. Times have changed. The Cheruscans are condemned to a life of slavery. Their freedom is lost. But not all Germanic tribesmen insist, like Segimerus, on freedom and independence. On the river Lahn, near the small town of Waldgirmas, archaeologists have made a remarkable discovery. When Roman remains were found here in 1993, they thought it was just another army camp. The Romans said they'd built proper towns east of the Rhine, but the experts had always dismissed it as propaganda. But now there was evidence of something more. This is a civilian town. So far, the only Roman town discovered on this side of the Rhine. This was planned to be used by Romans and Germans. Roman historian Cassius Dio described the strategy behind it. By building forums, houses and baths, the defeated peoples were seduced into peace. And then, archaeologists put together conclusive proof of Rome's attitude to its newly conquered territory. 
We were really surprised when we found fragments, gilded on one side with gold leaf. We soon realized that they must be parts of a bronze statue. But when we found a stirrup, a part of a harness and a horse's hoof, we said to ourselves, this is an equestrian statue. And, of course, the size of the parts made it clear how big the whole statue was. It was life-size. And since it was gilded, a statue at that time and at that place could only have been a statue of the Emperor Augustus. This golden monument stood in the Forum. The fact there was a gilded, life-size equestrian statue in Waldgirmes shows the Romans clearly making their claim to the territory, above all to the local population. You have to imagine how it would have looked to a local tribesman, standing in the forum, looking at this glistening gold statue of a horse and rider with a realistic portrait of the emperor. It must have seemed utterly amazing to him. Varus must have expected to find Germania already pacified when he arrived at Halton and met Arminius. Varus is tasked with turning Germania into a fully-fledged Roman province. Arminius' assessment of the situation is invaluable. But a mere captain of the auxiliary cavalry would never tell his general what to do. Varus insists, a German knows how to deal with Germans. He knows how to bring them into the empire. The blood in my veins may be German, Arminius says. My head and my tongue are Roman. Then Arminius must act like a Roman, Varus says. And Arminius is given his first mission. The legions are about to set out for their summer camp. Arminius is to reconnoitre the route. To demonstrate their dominance, the Romans move troops eastwards every summer. From their strongholds on the Rhine and the Lippe towards the river Weser, home to the Cheruski. Traveling through this uncharted wilderness is a daunting task. There are no roads of any kind. To transport their troops and keep them supplied, the Romans are forced to use the river Lippe. They've even developed a special boat for the purpose. It's a 30-meter flat-bottomed barge with a draft of only 40 centimeters. It can sail in shallow waters, carrying a load of 53 tons. With hundreds of these barges, Varus advances deep into Germania until the river is too narrow. The cargo is transferred to land. There's massive amounts of material. The legions travel with civilian support. Blacksmiths, carpenters, tax collectors, many with their families. Then there are the merchants with wine and olives. The little luxuries from back home that make life bearable for Romans in the chilly, savage north. The auxilia, mounted Germanic mercenaries, are to scout and secure the route. Arminius is their commander. A total of 22,000 people stretching for 15 kilometers, forcing their way across the plain. The soldiers marched in four columns, 
Every legion had a baggage train carrying its equipment. The whole column could cover, on average, 20 kilometers a day. The legions were aiming for an area close to today's Minden. Even today, it has a Latin name, Porta Westfalica. This is where the river Weser cuts through the Vien and Weser hills. For a long time, the exact location of Varus's summer camp was not known. But in 2008, archaeologists discovered Roman remains in a village near the river Weser. It's early days yet, but finds like these suggest this was a military base, perhaps Varus's summer encampment. Here's a peg from a legionary's tent. From his new forward position, Varus decides to impose Roman law on the barbarians. A people not subdued in battle may be controlled by the strict application of justice. But is this really the right time? Historian Valeus Paterculus has his doubts. He writes, Varus gave the Germans orders as if they already lived in slavery. He demanded tributes as if they were subjects. The tax collectors become notorious for demanding that the exact amounts of the different commodities are paid. The rules apply to everyone, without exception or delay. But the Roman tax authorities are disappointed by what they can drum up in Germanic villages. This land barely provides a surplus. The Germanic tribes are subsistence farmers. When their limited produce is confiscated, their frustration at Roman rule turns to hatred. And Roman law just makes things worse. For one person to judge between two parties in a dispute goes deeply against the Germanic sense of justice. It has been the privilege of the old Germanic nobles to negotiate between themselves matters of justice. The worst transgression? Varus condemns natives to be crucified for theft. In the Germanic world, only the gods hold sway over the life and death of a free man. Theft, even murder, are atoned by paying a fine known as the Wehrgeld. But Varus ignores the sacred Germanic traditions. The way Varus behaved in Germania was not so different from Roman policy elsewhere in the empire. He had to try to introduce Roman law because that was part of life in a Roman province. And if the Germanic peoples didn't like it, then that was a perfectly normal reaction on their part. Just think of today how people hate it when they find themselves being judged or imprisoned by a foreign power. Every community will try to resist when strangers come and try to impose their own form of justice. Varus brutally suppresses any sign of unrest. The ringleaders are executed, their villages burn.
What does Arminius make of this? He remembers his people as proud, free warriors. On his return, he finds them powerless, impotent, and demoralized, oppressed by the very power he himself represents. Perhaps no other choice is possible. He turns against Rome. Historians still dispute exactly why Arminius did it. The Roman sources tell us nothing. But maybe it's not difficult to understand. Arminius had the offensively Erfahrung. Arminius must have had experiences that led him to this change of heart. Rome had never completely replaced the Cheruscan world in his loyalties. He would have been tugged both ways when he made his decision. He must have been deeply fascinated by Rome, and he'd absorbed from it everything he'd need to carry out his plan. He used that and he combined it with his Germanic Cheruscan heritage to turn it against Rome. Rome, which he now felt could no longer be the future for his people. But maybe Arminius had selfish reasons to betray Rome. Any claim he might have to leadership of his own tribe had suffered by his proximity to Varus. Leading a successful revolt against Rome would give him enormous credit with all the Germanic peoples. Quite likely, Arminius had the ambition of becoming king of the Germanic peoples, something they had never been. According to this theory, he acted out of this strange combination of local patriotism and a distinctly Roman lust for power. If I fight against the Romans with my own people behind me, I can build up a powerful independent position that would never have been possible as a follower of the Romans. I would always be their puppet. And he certainly had a very strong lust for power. So this personal impulse, you could say it was a struggle for freedom at the same time if you want to, he was using this impulse to create his own kingdom, his own empire, an Arminius empire. And it's certainly no coincidence that he was later murdered by his own people because, in some ways, he was an enemy of Germanic freedom. Behind the backs of the Romans, Arminius calls the Germanic tribes together to test out their loyalty. He has to persuade them that he possesses the heil of a successful military leader. For the Germanic peoples, heil is the highest form of good fortune. He who earns it or is granted it by the gods will succeed in whatever he undertakes. And his heil is then shared with everyone who follows him. But it won't be easy to unite the Germanic tribes behind one goal. They prefer warring against each other. The worst enemy of a Germanic tribe is another Germanic tribe. There are tribal leaders who have been showered with gold and privileges by the Romans in exchange for their loyalty. One of these is Segestes, a relative of Arminius. Segestes has been elected leader of the Cheruski. 
Segestes tries hard to persuade his fellow tribal leaders that it would be suicidal to rise up against Varus and the legions. In every uprising until now, the Romans have been victorious, the tribes have been crushed. The revenge of the Romans has been terrible. To attack them again would only bring the same result again. Only this time, their reprisals will be even more brutal. A Roman prefect like Arminius should know better than anyone that the Romans are invincible. It's Arminius the Roman who reminds his people that they are living in slavery. That the weapons and symbols of occupation, the Romans' battle axes, reed bundles and togas, are infesting their forests and villages. That free men pay taxes and tributes to foreigners and are executed under Roman law. To convince the last waverers, scared they're heading for certain death and their families to slavery, Arminius reveals he has a plan. A plan that has to be carried out now. He promises to lead his followers to freedom. The grandeur of Rome, so effective in the intimidation of its enemies, is impotent here. Something will happen in these forests. Deadly danger is waiting, perfectly concealed. Varus and his soldiers are marching to disaster. The slaughter will break on the Romans with no warning and with savage fury. In the late summer of 9 AD, Varus's legions are getting ready to return to their winter quarters on the Rhine. Arminius begins to play a dangerous double game. He's preparing a plan to attack Varus's legions on the march back to the Rhine, while carrying on with his duty as an officer in the auxiliary cavalry. Varus and Arminius are close, almost like father and son. Later, they will reproach Varus for having been too trusting. But to Varus, Arminius is a Roman. His loyalty cannot be questioned. Behind his back, Arminius is wooing the warriors of the Germanic tribes in the dark forests. As a priestess prays to the gods, and confidently predicts a great victory. Arminius concentrates on the huge practical challenge of defeating the Romans. Even if the gods are on their side, the tribes will have no chance if they meet the Romans in open battle. When he fought beside them in Pannonia, he watched the legions advance with such force and with such discipline and order in every unit that the tribes would be defeated if they faced them directly. A tribal chieftain suggests attacking the Romans on the march while their line stretches like a long thin worm across the plains. 
Arminius reminds them that Varus had three legions. That's nearly 20,000 men. The tribes had neither the men nor the weapons for such an attack. They'd be sure to fail, but the Romans are terrified of the Germanic forests. They hate the marshes and the narrow valleys. They must be invited to enter the forests. Arminius was in a very good position. He knew the Roman army well. He'd been on campaigns crushing the great Pannonian rebellion where the Romans had to fight a long, tough war. And he had another advantage. The Romans trusted him. He was a Roman knight, a Roman officer. He must have had a great deal of charisma. People must have thought, this is the man who can make the changes we want in Germania. Rumors have reached the Romans that Germanic tribes are planning to rebel. Perhaps the legions should be marching in battle order. When Varus asks Arminius, he says it's just a rumor. But if Varus desires it, he'll scout the territory with his auxiliaries. Varus is satisfied, and all thoughts can turn to the distant homeland. The night before the march is due to start, the chieftain of the Cheruski comes to the Roman camp. Segestes opposes the plan to attack the legions, and Varus has invited him to a farewell meal. Segestes saw that Arminius was putting his own people, the Cheruski and the neighboring tribes, into serious danger. Quite a number of senior members of the Cheruski thought that Arminius's hopes of succeeding were really not that great at all. Sergestes takes a huge risk. He tries to warn Varus that a conspiracy and an uprising are planned against him and the Roman legions. Varus can't imagine who could be that foolhardy. Sergestes points to Arminius. On a September morning in the year 9 AD, Arminius leaves the camp with part of his auxiliary cavalry. Varus has dismissed Segeste's warning and given Arminius free hand to act as he wishes. After this first warning, there was no time for a second, the Roman sources say. The senior Roman commanders aren't as confident as Varus. But they can't see what Arminius could do, even if he were disloyal. Everyone has the same thought, to cross the forest safely and get back to the warmth and comfort of the winter quarters along the Rhine. Arminius is committed. There's no way back. The clatter of arms and the marching feet of thousands of legionaries could be heard deep in the forest as the 17th, 18th and 19th legions march out of their summer camp. The mood is light-hearted. A few more days of hardship in the wilderness and then the camps on the Rhine with wine, women and song, games and baths. Maybe Varus already sees himself back in Rome, enjoying a wealthy and contented retirement. He's marching to his doom with all of his 22,000 soldiers and their support units. The giant column probably takes the usual route, south from the river Weser, around the foothills of the Teutoburg forest, to the river Lippe, across that, and onto the Rhine. That's how it should be.
We still don't know how Arminius persuaded Varus and the legions to change their route. The Roman sources tell us simply, when Arminius and his auxiliaries were sent on ahead, they killed Roman troops stationed in their homeland. Arminius and his auxiliaries are still wearing Roman armor. The Roman soldiers see them as allies. In a surprise attack, they have no chance at all. Burn the towers. The auxiliaries torch the observation towers the Romans have erected at the edge of their marching routes. Arminius makes sure his attacks won't go unnoticed. At the end of their first day's march, the legions reach the foothills of the Teutoburg forest. The land is flat, the weather is dull but dry, and the troops are making good progress. And this is the moment Arminius burns the watchtower. Halt! How would Varus react? The Romans ask themselves what it can mean. Varus concludes that the rumors of an uprising were not groundless after all. Arminius must have come into conflict with rebels. Roman commanders in Germania would normally avoid entering forests or marshlands with their troops. If they had to cross a marsh, they would lay down a wooden walkway first. These were the Pontus Longi, the long bridges described by Roman historians. None has yet been found, but they were probably similar to the walkways the Germanic tribes constructed. This one is almost 3,500 years old built by the tribes living near the Venner Marsh, close to Osnabrück. On day two of the march, Varus makes a fatal mistake. He departs from the usual route and directs his legions into the forests. He's hurrying to Arminius' aid to nip the rebellion in the bud. The Cheruscan's plan is working. The Teutoburg Forest. Then as now, these highlands in northwest Germany are known for their craggy outcrops, impenetrable valleys and dense forests. It's a nightmare for Roman soldiers and impassable for an army of 22,000 men. Progress is painfully slow. Sliding in the mud and stumbling over tree roots, the soldiers can't stay in formation. Weighed down by their armor and weapons, the legionaries become more and more weary with each step. The supply wagons and the civilians slow their progress even more. Why Varus insists in penetrating ever deeper into the forest remains a mystery. 
Centurions do all they can to speed up the stragglers. With mixed success. The tribesmen know their way around the forests. Armed with just spears, axes and swords, they can appear from all directions at once, moving silently along well-trodden, well-disguised paths. Arminius maneuvers his men into position in the undergrowth. The Romans notice nothing. Long before they get to look an enemy in the face, the Romans are weakened by their struggle against the forest. Cassius Dio writes, even before the attack, the Romans were in enough trouble felling trees, laying walkways, and building bridges to advance. Precisely the situation Arminius intends to create. It was all happening pretty much as Arminius planned it. He was able to prepare his little surprises for the Romans along the route. He could choose the moment when they were too far from their usual route to turn back after the first attacks. They would say, we have to go on, we keep marching. And that way, they were walking further and further into the trap. Historians can't agree how many warriors Arminius was able to mobilize to fight Varus. It's hard to imagine the total came anywhere near the numbers of Varus's three legions. The Roman column has now become extremely stretched. Another advantage for the tribesmen. Their weapons are clearly inferior to the Romans. Axes, swords, wooden spears, and simple shields. The tribesmen didn't necessarily need superiority in numbers. Because they were attacking the Romans in a long column, they could choose the place for the assault. Say, for example, 3,000 legionaries are marching along a narrow front in a two-kilometer-long column, accompanied by wagons and mules, with people at the rear weighed down by packs, and they're suddenly attacked by 5,000 tribesmen. The tribesmen have both the element of surprise, and at that point, considerable numerical superiority. Arminius has one further crucial advantage. Legions crossing difficult country are given protection for their flanks. Auxiliary cavalry, Germanic mercenaries that he commands. And they have joined the rebellion. Varus cannot guess that the very forces that are protecting his flank will be the first to attack his legions. The warriors storm down from their hiding places in the hills. absolutely silent. Only the distant thunder of their feet betrays their presence. At that moment, the auxiliaries change sides. The attack finds the Romans entirely unprepared. there's barely time to raise the alarm. Yeah. 
The Germans fight more with their bodies than with their weapons, a Roman historian says. In the chaotic confusion of civilians and supply wagons, it's impossible to bring up reinforcements. The tribesmen and the auxiliaries attack from both sides, giving the Romans no chance to regroup. The most powerful army in the ancient world is defenseless. There are no armies marching in formation. This is just hit and run. The surprise has been total. Centurions have been cut down even before they can gather their troops into action. They couldn't fight back. But what do their enemies plan? Are they after booty or is it a major attack? All they know is that the enemy are present in large numbers. And where is Arminius? Varus decides the only option is to press on. As soon as they find a suitable place in the forest, they will halt, gather the legions, and build an emergency camp. According to Tacitus, the Romans managed to advance through the forest. Then, all three legions worked together to build a temporary camp. No single legion had been destroyed. One battle had been lost. The war could still be won. Vargas, uh... At this point, Varus was still following standard Roman procedure. He built a fortified encampment as well as he could in the terrain and given the state of his troops. And it was the right thing to do, because the enemy was nearby and he had to ensure that his men could at least rest that night without having to fight off non-stop attacks. The wall in the ditch with sentries placed behind it was precisely what was needed to make an impression on the enemy and make them think twice before launching an attack. Behind the ramparts, they tend to the wounded. While the commanders consider their options. They realize their losses are worse than they thought. Eight cohorts have been wiped out. The choices are poor. Maybe they should make a break for it. But marching on could be suicide. Varus must decide. Betrayed by the man he trusted most. His commanders urge him to stay behind their defenses. Messengers can be sent to the Halton and Xanten garrisons for reinforcements. There's no alternative. They need help. Varus rejects their advice. They can wipe out the barbarians once they leave the forest. He instructs his commanders to abandon the civilians and destroy the baggage train. Nothing must slow them down. The legions will march on at daybreak. The orders are clear and will be obeyed without question. It is a serious strategic error. The Germanic forces immediately spot the burning baggage train. A scout reports to Arminius. The Romans have ejected the civilians from the camp and are destroying their supplies. 
Some of the chieftains want to pillage before everything is burned. They know they owe their men booty. This is their chance. Arminius is furious. They could lose everything they've achieved so far. The tribes have sworn to obey him. He promises to lead them to victory if they obey his orders. Arminius's achievement here was in making his non too disciplined forces follow rational, deliberate tactics. Many of them would surely have seen this as cowardice, and they would have had to restrain themselves in order to go along with his plan. Morally, Arminius's behavior may be dubious, but there's no doubt that he was a military genius and a man torn between two cultures. Realistically, he has no chance against the Romans, but he still went ahead with his attack. The next morning, the legions leave the camp in battle order. Varus abandons the civilians to their fate. Perhaps he expects the barbarians to massacre them and plunder the supplies, and let his legions go free. But according to Tacitus, Arminius said that war is fought only against soldiers. This Germanic code of honor was based on sound reasoning. If Arminius spared the civilians in the baggage train, that wouldn't have been for humanitarian reasons. It was a great opportunity to take them prisoner and then hold them to ransom. Trading in people, prisoners of war, is perfectly normal in warfare, because people mean manpower, and that's extremely valuable ist etwas ganz kostbares und ähm, deswegen sehe ich So I don't see that as evidence that Arminius was a man of integrity who was sparing civilians he was simply being practical hat sondern das hatte ganz praktische Züge On the third day the weather turns Torrential rain brings the legion's forced march to a halt. Their armor, now soaking wet and heavy as lead, makes the soldiers even less mobile than before. For Arminius and his men, this is perfectly normal weather. Cassius Dio writes, Heavy storms broke out. While the Romans fought the elements, the barbarians moved into position, surrounding them on all sides. Arminius now unleashes an attack of appalling brutality. seem like evil spirits. There's no time for a heroic rearguard action. No time to look after the wounded. One chronicler wrote, caught in the bogs and the forests, the Romans were butchered man by man by the same enemy they had butchered like cattle so many times before.
finally in the chaos, Varus loses control of his legions. There are no generals left for the soldiers to follow. His army falls apart. In the space of 24 hours, Varus has faced two overwhelming attacks on his legions. He must have come to realize that victory is now beyond his grasp. He can only hope to avoid annihilation. One of his cavalry commanders finally reaches the scene of the massacre. He finds Varus at his wit's end. with no idea what to do. This could be the last chance to call for reinforcements. Pneumonius volunteers to break out with his cavalry to the nearest Roman stronghold before the horses are too exhausted to move. According to Roman historians, Pneumonius only wanted to save his own skin. He left the foot soldiers in the lurch and fled towards the Rhine. But fate took its revenge. As Paterculus recorded, death overtook the traitor on the way. Whatever Varus and Pneumonius may have planned, Arminius is a step ahead. Another trap awaits the fleeing cavalry. Not a single horseman will make it to the Rhine. Now, the legionaries waste no time to get moving. Nothing matters but getting out of the forest. The tribesmen are always just behind them. They know they only have to drive the Romans forwards. And the legions stumble blindly on. But the knight's forced march has done the trick. At last, three days after the Romans left their regular route, the forest gets lighter, the land gets flatter. At last, there's a glimmer of hope. The Romans are safe. Open country. If Varus had been counting on Pneumonius's cavalry, he realizes now that all hope is lost. And Arminius makes sure the Romans understand they're still in the trap. Tracing their progress, we can assume that Varus and the remains of his legions moved north on the third day and marched over the Vihan hills until they reached the North German plain. They turn west towards the Rhine. They're marching into a bottleneck just 80 meters wide between the Kalkriza mountain to the south and a giant swamp to the north. Just a few years ago, archaeologists stumbled on the remains of a palisade wall. Behind these ramparts, Arminius and his men are thought to have waited in ambush for Varus for the final decisive blow. 
That's what the experts believe. From the earth in front of the wall, they dug up thousands of nails and pieces of lead of Roman origin, domestic objects like scissors, but also spear tips and tools. Is this the site of the last battle? Pride of place goes to a Roman cavalry officer's ceremonial mask. Die Funde von Karl Griese sind zwar sehr zahlreich, aber das Gesamtgelände... Though there are very many finds at Karl Griese, the whole terrain is quite small. And sources tell us of a central event involving three legions, and at least 10 to 15,000 men, if not 20,000. So far, the finds at Karl Griese don't reflect those numbers. Even if conclusive proof is still lacking, Kalkriza was soon declared the definitive location of the battle. The museum is a magnet for tourists. Kalkriza's supporters base their case on the dates of the coins found at the site. Nach den bisherigen Indizien spricht Judging by the current evidence, there's a great deal more that argues for Kalkriza than against it. We found coins with Varus's likeness on them. So these coins must have found their way into the ground at the time Varus was governor, that is, 7 to 9 AD. We can be sure about that. The second point is, we found no coins that were minted after 9 AD among the 1800 or so that we have dug up. Scientists have found traces of a battle along a 10-kilometer stretch of the Vian Mountains. This allows us to reconstruct a clear scenario for the third decisive day. The lie of the land in Kalkriza, over the whole area we're working on, makes it clear that the Roman army was moving from east to west and that the tribesmen attacked them repeatedly from the lower slopes of Kalkriza Hill. We can demonstrate this over a zone of at least 10 kilometers. We can show that the tribesmen kept harrying the marching Roman army with small-scale darting attacks. When the Romans emerge from the forest and form up in the open, Arminius gathers his men for the final battle. The legions have nothing to counter the tribe's cry of freedom or death. Now they sent victory. More and more tribesmen are going over to Arminius. Even Roman allies like Segestes, through opportunism, not conviction. We shouldn't get ideas about the honorable Germanic peoples. That's an 18th and 19th century idea. Archaeology can bring us down to earth here. We see from the battlefield that there was plunder, probably the stripping of corpses. Taking booty was very important. It was an opportunity to enrich themselves with silver, gold, bronze, and even iron. The battle is a victory over the Romans that no one would have thought possible. Close to 15,000 soldiers lie dead in the forest. The few survivors drag themselves across the plain, waiting to be captured and slaughtered. There could be no greater humiliation for the superpower that is Rome. Arminius' victory is unprecedented. Of the Roman historians, it was Tacitus who really understood its significance. Arminius was indisputably the liberator of Germania. Varus would become the scapegoat for the greatest military disaster Rome had ever experienced. He commits suicide on the battlefield, 
as Paterculus disdainfully comments. This commander had more courage to die than to fight. In the end, he ran himself through. Even after three days of fighting, the bloodshed is not at an end. The victorious tribesmen pass over the battlefield, ripping armor and weapons from the bodies of the dead and dying. They sacrifice captured legionaries to the gods that granted them victory. The standards of the legions are stamped into the mud, and Varus's corpse is defiled. His head goes on a terrible journey to the Emperor Augustus in Rome. If the tribes stay loyal, Arminius can build on his triumph. In his hour of victory, he is the undisputed leader of the Germanic tribes. But will the Romans seek revenge? The short-term result of Arminius' victory was that Augustus abandoned his plans to occupy Germania as far as the River Elbe. That's clear. Augustus had to fight plenty of internal battles, and he had a tough time imposing his policy. Plenty of people in Rome who said, we can't accept this humiliation, we must hit back. But Augustus believed it wasn't worth it. Germania didn't have enough to offer the Romans. The tribes should be left to massacre each other. We'll make sure we always support the weaker side, so they can keep fighting the stronger ones. And we're sitting pretty, and the Germanic tribes are no longer a problem for us. Six years later, in 15 AD, Roman legions returned to the site of the disaster. Tacitus describes the terrible discoveries made by the legions under the command of Germanicus. Bleached bones were lying all over the forest floor. Skulls were nailed to trees. These were the barbarians' altars on which they slaughtered the tribunes and centurions. Almost 2,000 years later, archaeologists in Calcrisa discover bones buried in a mass grave. They're all the bones of men. They show signs of violence. They were exposed to the elements for a long time before being buried. Could this be proof that Calcrisa was the site of the battle? Perhaps the archaeologists have confirmed the truth of Tacitus' account 2,000 years later. But not everyone is satisfied, and the search for the battlefield goes on. Germanicus failed in his attempt to take revenge, to crush the Germanic tribes. Arminius fought more battles against the Romans and kept them at bay. Germanicus was ordered back to Rome. The superpower withdrew to the Rhine. Germania would never become a Roman province. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was one of the most significant of the ancient world. It resulted in a fundamental and long-lasting cultural divide that split Europe in two. Here on the Rhine, where the Xanten Archaeology Park now stands, was a Roman town with temples, an amphitheater and baths. 
This was a center of antique civilization. On the other side of the river, the Germanic tribes remained what they were, free and volatile. The Germania simply carried on as it had done before the Romans came. Germania was anything but a unified nation. It was many centuries before bigger tribal groupings formed, like the Alemans or the Franks, who were finally strong enough to bring down the Roman Empire in the West. Dann wiederum stark genug gewesen sind, das römische Reich auch im Westen in die Knie zu zwingen. Arminius paid for his ambition of creating a Germanic kingdom with his life. He was poisoned, probably by his own family. Without a common enemy, the land fell back into a state of permanent feuding. No chieftain could tolerate another exceeding him in power and influence, a situation that would characterize this part of Europe until modern times. Das Problem the problem for the kings was always the aristocracy. And that problem lasted in Germany until the reign of Frederick William IV. When he was offered the throne in 1848, he said, yes, but what do the other princes think? He doesn't care what the people think, but he's afraid of his peers, the other crowned heads of Germany. So we can say that this sense of envy, this sense of rivalry with the aristocracy, becomes a permanent factor in Germany. Arminius was long regarded as the German hero. The adoration reached its zenith with the completion of the Hermann Monument in 1875. The sword points towards France, Germany's arch enemy in the 19th century, even though Arminius had fought against Rome. But that doesn't minimize his achievement of challenging and defeating Rome at her peak. But we would know nothing of this hero if his enemies hadn't told his story. It was Tacitus, Rome's greatest historian, who wrote the words that immortalized this barbarian tribesman. He was undefeated in war. His life lasted 37 years, and his power, 12. Today, they still sing his praises among the barbarian peoples.